Good morning, friends, and happy Sabbath to you. And welcome to our Piedmont Park Seventh-day Adventist Church online Sabbath school lesson study. I am Pat Barber, and with me and leading our discussion is Pastor Ray Daniel. Good morning, Pastor Ray. Good morning. <laughs> Pastor Ray wears many, many hats, and um, today he is really on the run, so... Um, on my Apple watch here, it always has a little thing that comes up to tell me to move and to, you don't need those kind of reminders, Pastor Ray. It sounds like you're on the, on the run and on the move all the time. Well, friends, last week we talked about um, uh, the self-exaltation of uh, Satan and uh, how much he exalted himself and the result of that. This week, we're going to continue that study but this week, we are especially going to focus in on the opposite of that. So his, his government is about self-exaltation. Christ's government is about self-renouncing love. And so that's where we're going to kind of concentrate our efforts today. And we're going to look at the early church and the model, uh, the, how they followed the model of Christ and how we are attempting to do the same thing today. So I think that we have a great study in, in store for us. And there's, as always, when you're studying anything in relation to uh, the cosmic conflict, there's always a lot. So again, we want to remind you to do some study on your own. Do some, there's some extra readings that are very interesting readings in the great controversy. As a matter of fact, perhaps you haven't read that for a long time. And so this is a good time now to kind of renew uh, that. And then just to look into these studies at a greater, uh, in greater depth on your own, because we really are only able to, to just uh, essentially scratch the surface, as it were, because the more I studied, the more I could have studied on it. And um, so we want to encourage you to do that. I don't think we've given you that reminder for a while. So before we get into our study, though, let's ask uh, our Father to uh, uh, bless it for us. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful to you, Lord, for your love and care uh, of us, your um, unconditional love that regardless, no matter what the circumstances are, that you continue to love us and continue to woo us to yourself. Dear Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit to guide, direct, and instruct us Father, clear our, the cobwebs out of our minds so that we can grasp these great truths because we know that the enemy is certainly at work and certainly does not want us to have this knowledge. But we also recognize that knowledge only informs. Knowledge doesn't really transform. Your Holy Spirit is what transforms us. And so we ask for that. Father, we pray for each person and, and their families that are going to be uh, viewing this lesson at whatever po whichever point that they do so. We pray for each person in our prayer box. We ask for special intervention on the behalf and the request of each person that is placed there according to your will and according to your beneficent goodness. And dear Father, now we ask you to quiet the noise of the week, clear the cobwebs for us, please, we pray, and bless this study in Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. It's all yours, Pastor Ray. Well, let's see what we can do here then. All right. I think we're going to need this. How about that? Does that look like what we may want to follow? I That's exactly is. what we want. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. As you shared a moment ago, the theme is the central issue. Love or selfishness? Yes. This uh, passage from Isaiah, I think, has to be one of your very favorites. And I think <laughs> it is of a lot of people. It is. Not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. <clears throat> Our introduction, um, I thought, was quite unique. It uh, does a hypothetical picture for us. Uh, it says, suppose you're a herdsman and you're tending your goats on the Mount of Olives. You're overlooking Jerusalem. 
and you hear voices. Immediately, you recognize the voice of Jesus. And as the setting sun gleams off the temple and reflects in snowy whiteness, its magnificent marble walls, you hear Jesus say, Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, we have no idea that this occurred, that there were shepherds uh, hearing this, herdsmen and so forth. But we know that the disciples heard it, and they were very confused by it. And if any of these herdsmen heard it, I'm sure they were as well. But what, what did Jesus mean? Uh, well, he manifestly and masterfully blended events leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem that he had predicted with those that would take place just before his return at the end of time. And so in the destruction of Jerusalem, we discover a foreshadowing of Satan's strategy both to deceive and destroy God's people at the end of time. So it's a twofold message there in Matthew 24, 1 to 51. Uh, it had to be shocking uh, when he spoke these words. It says he departed out of the temple and his disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. They were so proud of them. Uh, they were exquisite. Uh, they were the pride of the nation. And that's when Jesus said, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Well, the disciples couldn't believe that. Uh, and they said, um, uh, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Uh, why did they jump to the sign of his coming and the end of the age? Because they could only imagine that the destruction of the temple would be the end of all things. It would be That's the right. end of the world. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. And yes. Jesus said, no, no, hold on. Uh, there's a lot more to happen before that. So you have to especially watch out for deception. Don't let anyone deceive you. Uh, there are going to be a lot of deceivers uh, that will come. They're going to say, I am Christ, and they're going to deceive many. You're also going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. Uh, don't, don't be troubled. All these things must come to pass. The end is not yet. Uh, he says there are going to be... Uh, Battles between nations, rising and falling between them, kingdoms against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes. Sounds like the, the nightly news, doesn't it? It does indeed. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds exactly like the nightly news. It's almost hard to watch the news. Yeah. Because yeah. you know what it's going to be. That's uh, right. You know, the, the horrible weather, uh, uh, earthquakes, tornadoes, various things. And then uh, if that's not enough, he says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. That's just the beginning. Uh, you're going to be delivered up to tribulation and killed and hated of all nations for my name's sake. Really makes you want to be a Christian, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> right. Right. And so he says, uh, you can imagine that many will be offended and betray one another and hate one another. Things are going to get bad within the church family. And they're going to be many false prophets, and they're going to deceive many. And because all this happens, the love of many is going to grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Mm -hmm. So there's our challenge uh, to be among this group right here, the ones who endure to the end and are saved. Amen. 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 That's where we want to be. Um, says if, if it were not shortened all this trouble, uh, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Mm. Don't believe anybody telling you Christ is here or he's there. Uh, that's a deception. Uh, mm -hmm. I've told you that beforehand. If they say to you, look in in the desert for him, don't go out there. Mm -hmm. In the inner rooms, don't believe it. Whereas the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, 
so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you like lightning storms. I do. I I, I don't want to be out in one, but I love, no. you know, the flashes of lightning are brilliant mm -hmm. and, and, and powerful and beautiful. And it says his coming will be like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, he assures them heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only, which means he doesn't even know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. But yet we have people that are continually <laughs> setting dates. And uh, and despite the this marvelous warning, last week we talked about warnings, how he gives warnings for various things. And here's one here now, but yet it's one that's not heeded at all. The setting of the dates. And then the one that you mentioned previously just a moment ago, and that is related to uh, ones that are uh, imitating him saying, you know, the one in the desert or in uh, the, in Texas or in uh, Idaho or wherever it is, you know, and you need to go there to see him. And people have misconstrued and said, oh, well, if it's on the television, that's how every eye is going to see it. No, that's not what he's saying here. <laughs> no, and not at all. Not at not all. At all. Um. But he says, watch out for the idea that it's uh, it's way off in the future. Uh, he says, if an evil servant says, my master's delaying his coming, mm -hmm. and he begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink mm -hmm. with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him at an hour that he's not aware of. So he says, don't put it off. Don't think it's way off in the future. Uh, you need to be watching and looking for you don't know what hour it's going to be. I don't even know, he says. Mm -hmm. So we're going to study Satan's twofold strategy, both to deceive and destroy God's people. What the evil one fails to accomplish through persecution, he hopes to achieve through compromise. Well, on Sunday, we looked at a broken hearted savior. As Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, he was looking over the city of Jerusalem. And John's gospel says, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. Even though he did everything he could to save them, they didn't receive him. His love flowed from a heart of infinite love. And he repeatedly appealed to them in love to repent and accept his gracious invitation of mercy. And we see a picture of that in Luke and in Matthew. Mm -hmm. As he drew near the city, he saw it and wept over it. Wept over it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in Matthew 23, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said in John 5, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Mm -hmm. And sadly, Isn't that, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm going to say sadly. His special <laughs> people still are that way today. They won't That's come. To right. That's there right. are some. There's a group called mm -hmm. Jews for Jesus, but mm -hmm. the majority will not come to him that they might have. Mm -hmm. Yes, Sister Beth. Exactly. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Not at uh, all. I, was just, I was just thinking of when the snake was put on the staff <laughs> and raised in the wilderness. Right. And all they had to, all you had to do was look at it. <laughs> there were some who wouldn't even look at it. Wouldn't even look. And uh, just by looking at it, you would have life. And so what a what a horrible thought to think of this stubbornness. And then on the other hand, though, I did read a story about where uh, a mother was drowning in a river. It go, the story goes and that the son dived into the river, tried to rescue her. But she's flailing and trying to save herself and, and uh, 
I mean, she's just all over because she's afraid, of course, obviously. Sure. She didn't realize that she was powerless to save herself and that the person that was there to save her, she was making it impossible for him to save her. Anyway, she nearly strangled him. And uh, in the end, she died. And at the funeral, he just wept and he kept saying, mother, mother, I wanted to save you, but you wouldn't let me. Oh. And so that's a... a another illustration of the same oh, thing yeah. of Christ continually uh, as he uh, continually woos each of our hearts. He wants to save us. He wants to draw us unto himself, but it's like, we're so busy trying to do it on our own, essentially that we make it impossible for him to save us. Exactly. Exactly. Or just outright or just outright deny him, but you yeah. know, just outright uh, de uh rebel against what he's trying to do for us. But the song expresses it so simply and clearly. Turn your eyes yes. on Jesus. Yes. Look full in his wonderful face. That's what he yes. wants everyone That's to That's right. Mm -hmm. Now we were asked, what do these verses tell us about Jesus' attitude toward his people and their response to his loving invitation? Well, it certainly shows that he had incredible, great love for them and that they refused it. That's right. And what revelation of God's character do we see in these verses? We see that God truly is love. He loves yes. all of his children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, we know, go ahead. Just one, one other quick point to think about the fact that uh, the three instances that I think about of Christ weeping uh, that I have, that, that I wrote uh, notes on here was of course with Lazarus, he wept then. Right. Um, not so much that I don't think that Lazarus had died, but he sees the grief and he never intended anyone to experience that kind of grief, you know, the compassion and love that he has for his friends that are, because he knows he's going to raise Lazarus uh, right. and that, so that, that deep, uh, sadness that I never wanted this for you. I never wanted you to mourn and to suffer like this. And then the next one, obviously, in, in Luke, as we're reading here about Jerusalem, that he sees what's going to happen there. He has the solution. He's trying to offer them this cure for cancer, if you will, and they're not accepting it, as we've okay. said. And then, of course, that third one in, you know, in Gethsemane, where he actually sweat blood. And yeah. so with because of that agony, again, not for himself so much as for us, you know, that he would uh, suffer such uh, for us. So when we think about the brokenheartedness of our Christ, that's a pretty deep thought. And it really requires us to reflect upon that and to think about that. And I think, again, we go back to the scripture and or to the admonition and, and suggestion that uh, we spent a thoughtful hour, <laughs> you know, looking at his life and looking at those closing events in particular, because to think about the king and creator of all that is weeping is just unbelievable. You think about how upset your kids were when they saw you sad, or if they thought that you were really sad, it really bothers them a lot. They don't, that's not something, that's something parents usually try to keep away from their kids. We don't usually let them know how ups, how uh, sad they might know how upset we are, <laughs> but they may not know how sad, but they may not know how sad we are, you know? That's right. And, and so when we think about that with our own savior, it's, it's uh, something that really evokes such deep emotion within us as well. Amen. Yeah. We were also presented with a conundrum in our study it says it's difficult to understand such an event as the destruction of Jerusalem in the light of God's loving character. We've just seen a beautiful picture of his love, his weeping over mm -hmm. the city and so forth. How does that, how does that um, coexist with the destruction, uh, with the thousands and thousands of people, men, women, and children slaughtered in that destruction? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how could his heart be broken if he allowed that to happen? Um, where was he when his people were suffering so greatly under this destruction? Um, 
Well, we can be sure that his eyes were filled with tears at that time because he had continually reached out to them to prevent that. And, and yet by their rebellion, uh, they forfeited his divine protection. protection. So mm -hmm. uh, he had to allow the natural consequences of rebellion to develop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he didn't cause the slaughter of all those innocent children and uh, adults. Um, the tragic death of the innocents was Satan's act. It wasn't God's. And that's something we be, have to be sure we understand that it's not inconsistent with his uh, with his nature of love at all. Uh, he did everything he could to prevent it, but they chose to go that route where it ended up happening, and mm -hmm. then they had to suffer those consequences. That's right. So, and and Pastor Ray, we do want to point out here too that uh, although God does not always intervene to limit the results of people's choices, he allows the natural consequences of rebel rebellion to develop, as, as stated here, and as you've said. He also, though, there are many, many instances where in spite of us, he does save us, that uh, he doesn't always... Uh, so, so I, I think the operative word here is that God does not always, I think that's the word there. So not in every instance, because there are times when in spite of ourselves, he does save us and he does intervene and he does pull us back from the fire uh, in, in spite of the fact that that's the choice that we made. And then some of the time he does not do that. You know, uh, as a loving parent, he knows exactly what to do, when to do how uh, the appropriate thing to do at the appropriate time. And we have to trust him that he does. Right, right, indeed. Uh, Matthew 24 uh, contained uh, the interesting section there about um, the abomination of desolation. And it says, when you see that, uh, those who are in Judea need to flee to the mountains. Uh, don't take any time to go down in your house and get anything. Uh, mm -hmm. if you're in the field. Don't go back and try to get your clothes. Uh, get out of there. And That's pray right. that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. So he gave instruction to his people to save them from this coming destruction. And he said, you need to escape uh, before the attack. Now, we need to remember um, that the vast majority of Christians living in Jerusalem in AD 70 were Jewish. They came from mm -hmm. a Jewish background. Mm -hmm. uh, so they would not have been distinguished from the other people by the enemy. Uh, they would have all been Jewish people as far as they were concerned. Mm -hmm. So uh, instead, he said, you being aware of my uh, warning, you need to listen to that. Uh, you need to get out while the getting is good. Uh, <laughs> So why was that good counsel? Uh, and it still is, uh, because God is love. And yes. we need to follow what he recommends for these last days as well, because we will be the better for it. And he's giving us the counsel because he is loving and he loves us. That's right. Well, Amen. we see uh, on Monday about the... Uh, preservation of the Christians during the attack. Uh, God's mercy, grace, providence, and foreknowledge are clearly revealed in the events leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, the Roman army surrounded the city, and then when it seemed they were about to uh, attack and come on into the city, they, le they left. And the Jewish armies pursued them, won a great victory. Mm -hmm. And uh, while they were gone pursuing the Romans, uh, the Christians uh, got out got out of town. They, right. they fled, yeah. uh, and they fled to a very significant place in archaeological history. They they fled to Pella, in Perea, uh, beyond the Jordan River, and uh, they were mighty thankful that they had listened to his counsel to get out of town. Mm -hmm. Events were so overruled that neither Jews nor Romans could hinder their flight. 
So they experience the assurance that God is the refuge and strength of his people. He's a very present help in trouble. And our memory verse again says, fear not, I'm with you. Mm -hmm. God is made. I'm your God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do these passages tell us about his providential care? That, that it's real. Mm -hmm. We can count on it. Amen. Uh, he's sovereign. He overrules events on earth for the ultimate accomplishment of his divine purposes. But there will be times when God's people experience hardship and persecution and imprisonment, death itself. But even in the most challenging of times, with Satan's most vicious attacks, God sustains and preserves his church. Mm -hmm. And we need to constantly remember these promises there in uh, Psalm 46 and Isaiah 41 of his being our refuge and strength and our helper. We see in Hebrews 11 accounts of how many were treated, uh, many of his people. Uh, the first verse, verse 35 uh, is a positive one. Women receive their dead raised to life again. That sounds real good. Yeah. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Others had trial of mocking, scourgings, chains, imprisonment, stones, sawn in two, tempted, <laughs> slain with the sword, <laughs> wandered about in sheepskins, goatskins, destitute, afflicted, tormented, wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. Wow. So uh, what reality do these texts reveal about our battle with the forces of evil? It's a very real battle. Very real. We face a determined foe. Mm -hmm. And but, he takes no pris and he takes no prisoners. <laughs> you yeah, know. That's right. That's right. And how do these passages harmonize with the idea of God's protection that we just studied? Uh, yeah. Is there a contradiction in the idea of God's protection and his allowing some to face painful suffering, even a martyr's death? Um, well, that he does protect, but he does not prevent all suffering. And you shared that a moment ago. He doesn't prevent it all. Uh, mm -hmm. It's up to his wisdom and love in terms of when he does and when he doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Um, Satan tried everything he could uh, to destroy the church by violence. And when uh, that didn't work, uh, he tried uh, something else. And he's mm -hmm. still trying that today. That's right. And uh, one of the biggest lies today, Pastor Ray, is, and you hear this all the time, from, from some, sometimes from Christians and non-Christians most certainly, if God is love, why did, why did he allow you can fill in the blank. Oh, know? yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that. And uh, but our position is just to remain steadfast. That's the go that's one of the golden threads. We've spoken often of these golden threads that we see through scripture. And for us is to remain steadfast, trusting him and his goodness and his uh, infinite wisdom in terms of how to act, when to act, and why to act, I guess. That's right. uh, we see here in page 41 of Great Controversy, by defeat, by defeat, God's people conquered. Mm -hmm. God's workmen were slain, but his work went forward steadily, didn't stop. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. well, what should it mean to us that the Bible writers, who certainly knew pain and suffering, could nevertheless again and again write about the reality of God's love? How could they do that? How when could they, they do going that? they through these horrible things. Mm -hmm. It was only because of their total fixed confidence in God. They weren't, they were not doubting it. They believed totally in him and his love and faithfulness. And we're asked the question, well, how can we experience that same kind of love for ourselves? Mm -hmm. well, it has to be the same way. Uh, we have to have that kind of total fixed confidence in him. What are you saying? That's right. And we've talked in the past about how to um, um, how, how do we attain that? And we talked about it through through study of his word. It's through prayer. 
It's, you know, it's making a commitment. It's not, again, as we, as was mentioned earlier, not just taking information in, it's not just consuming, but also allowing that information to transform us, you know, uh, right. it's through fellowship with others and practicing charity, you know, using Christ as our model uh, and so forth. So those are things that we do then to, uh, in order to help fix our confidence. It's just not going to come out of thin air. No, I guess. no, it isn't. It's got to come through our own experience. Uh, so we see how faithful they were uh, amid all this persecution. And in spite of the persecution, despite imprisonment, despite torture, the church grew and it grew rapidly. Uh, we see accounts of that in Acts here. Uh, it says on one day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Uh, Acts 4.4. 4. Uh, the number of men came to be about 5,000. Uh, mm. What were they doing during all this time of uh, maltreatment? They were praying. They were assembling. They were being filled with the Holy Spirit. They were speaking the word of God with boldness. Mm. Uh, they didn't cease teaching and mm. preaching Jesus as the Christ, even though they brought them there and said that, we, you know, we condemn you from speaking in his name again. They continued to do it. Uh, they didn't stop. Uh, and they went about uh, helping all the people that they could, uh, going everywhere they could to share the word. Uh, we see a picture of Philip going down to, to Samaria itself, uh, hmm. preaching Christ to them. We know how uh, the Jewish people felt about the Samaritans and the, and the story Jesus told of the good Samaritan. You know, they couldn't imagine a good Samaritan. Uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah, and yet, uh, and yet Philip went down there to those quotes bad people and he preached Christ to them. Um, and he performed miracles and healings and so forth. Uh, many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, uh, and there was great joy in that city. So, what do these verses teach us about the challenges the New Testament church faced and why it grew so rapidly? Uh, it says that they were involved with threats and imprisonment and persecution and death, but at the same time, they were courageously proclaiming Christ in yes. the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, that didn't stop them at all. And That's they funny. continued to speak and teach in his name. Um, well, they finally uh, laid hands uh, on the apostles. They put them in prison. And uh, then they grabbed uh, Stephen, and they were stoning Stephen. As they stoned Stephen, he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Mm. Destroyed him. Uh, then they killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Uh, we think of them, you know, almost like twin brothers, James and John. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can imagine how John and the others felt when his brother was killed. Uh, but they didn't stop. They continued to perform their ministry and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. The bastions mm -hmm. of hell were shaken. The shackles of Satan were broken. Pagan superstition crumbled before the power of the resurrected Christ. The gospel triumphed in the face of overwhelming odds. Faith filled the disciples' hearts. One glimpse of their resurrected Lord changed their lives. Jesus gave them a new reason for living. Not only did he do that, he gave them the great commission that was to mm -hmm. all the world mm -hmm. and gave them the great promise that they were going to receive power to do it. Uh, the gospel penetrated, as a result, the remotest corners of the faith. It went everywhere. Uh, to where the Apostle Paul said in Colossians 1, uh, the gospel which you heard was preached to every creature mm. under heaven. Wow. It didn't mm. stop them at all, did it? No, mm. it didn't. No, not at all. <laughs> I'm sure you probably found this next section of our lesson as interesting as I did. Uh, it was an account from uh, history not from the Bible itself, 
uh, but from the history of that period uh, regarding someone named Pliny the Younger. He was mm -hmm. governor of the Roman province of Bithynia, which is uh, on the northern coast of modern Turkey. Uh, and he wrote to the emperor around AD 110. Uh, his statement is significant because it was nearly 80 years after the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. And he described the official trials he was conducting to find and execute Christians. Mm -hmm. He was doing this. For many persons of all ages and classes and both sexes are being put in peril by accusation. And this will go on. Uh, he was commending himself for that. Yes. The contagion of this superstition has spread not only in the cities, but in the villages and rural districts as well. <laughs> huh. He said, I'm trying to stamp this out. It's just going everywhere. It's going like wildfire. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. despite the devil's vicious attacks, the Christian church grew rapidly. Rapidly. So we're yeah. asked, well, what can we learn from this um, that can help us as the end time church? And that is that we have to continue to courageously proclaim Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit, no matter what the cost. Amen. 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 Absolutely true. But not only uh, did they preach, they cared for the community, not just themselves, not just the Christian community, but the entire community around them. Uh, it grew not only because they preached, but because they lived the gospel. They, they modeled the ministry of Christ, just like he did, going about healing and uh, dealing with suffering people. Jesus deeply cared for people, and so did the New Testament church. And we see here in Acts 2, Acts 3, Acts 6, examples of that, where they shared things together. Uh, they uh, went around... Uh, helping people, just like Peter did with the lame man, healing mm -hmm. him, raising him up. Mm -hmm. um, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglecting them. These are the Hebrew Christians, the mm -hmm. Jewish. Uh, and they said, uh, you know, they're getting favorable treatment and we're not. So they dealt with that and uh, asked the Holy Spirit's help, and they chose uh, these deacons to take care of those issues. And as a result of that added step of uh, uh, personnel, the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And even a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Priests! Yeah. The priests! Mm -hmm. hmm. That's wonderful to hear. That is wonderful, yes. So although our circumstances may be different, what, what principles can we learn from these passages? Well, as you say here, uh, we are to be united. We are to be of one mind. Uh, that is to have one focus and mission and focused on ministry. That is that that should be something that's important in our lives. Not mm -hmm. just as a, not something that you, you do it when you get to it, or when you have time, it should be something that's for these people, it was front and center for them. This was a, a, a true focal point for them. Mm -hmm. And Pastor Ray, have you noticed, noticed something here too about this is that they are addressing the physical needs of people. Yes. They are addressing the spiritual needs of people. Right. And uh, obviously the, the mental, uh, uh, emotional, psychological needs of people is is addressed as well, because if you now are given some good news, you know, or you're alleviating some suffering, all of that, of course, has an impact on your uh, emotional, uh, psychological uh, self. Amen. And I am grateful to the Lord that that is one of the missions I, of our church is fo focusing holistically. That would have been a better word. I could have used that and saved all that, those other words. But you know, <laughs> but you know, it's just a holistic look at the person. And uh, having worked in, trained in at uh, our at, uh, Adventist hospital, I can see how that worked. 
uh, how much that focus mm -hmm. is there, you know, yeah. and people, and, and you don't have to worry. They, they didn't have to worry that people would say, oh, they're going to be pushing their religion down our throats. I don't want to go to that hospital. Quite the opposite. At uh, Florida Hospital in Orlando, it was a very much sought after hospital, even to the uh, extent that Disney asked them to build a hospital uh, in their celebration city uh, because they liked that model of healthcare. Mm -hmm. And we know that that's a model that came from God and it's one that's modeled after what we're reading here. Mm -hmm. So that's just one, just the healthcare is just one model that I think that we as a church follow in terms of uh, mm -hmm. modeling from the early church. I just wanted to point that one out, but there's mm -hmm. others that we could grab from that that we as a church uh, follow as well. Amen. Uh, have you heard of the organization called Amen? Amen. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, yeah. Amen stands for Adventist Medical Evangelism. Oh, yeah, I guess I had thought about the mnemonic for that. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Dustin and Christine were involved in that ministry last Sabbath in oh. Cadillac, Michigan, where they live. Mm -hmm. uh, they shared with us this week how they got up around 6 a.m., started the day, and uh, and uh, ministered to people all the way through 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, mm -hmm. They did say that the Cadillac Church had to uh, uh, provide $30,000 to bring the Amen group in. Oh, wow. They had to be committed to this ministry to do that. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there were yeah. medical personnel, dentists, and doctors mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. travel all over the country uh, performing this ministry when invited by a local church. And so they uh, invited them to Cadillac, uh, which means the Cadillac church must have some money <laughs> <laughs> able to do that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and they enjoyed uh, serving the people throughout the day. Uh, Christine worked in the uh, in the vision portion mm -hmm. of the ministry that day, and she got her picture taken and in the newspaper. Oh, as a result oh, nice. of her work sure. in that ministry. Sure. So, uh, yeah, um, we do have uh, the opportunity today as well to be engaged in this kind of united focused ministry. Yes. Uh, so, the New Testament believers uh, followed this model of Christ. Uh, just like it says about Jesus, he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good, healing all mm -hmm. oppressed by mm -hmm. the devil. God was with him. So as his body on earth, Christ's followers sought to follow that same pattern. Uh, the purpose of the gospel is to restore the image of God in humanity. Mm -hmm. And this restoration includes physical, mental, emotional and spiritual healing. He longs for us to be physically, healthily, mm -hmm. mentally alert, emotionally stable, and spiritually whole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is especially true in the light of his promised return. We need to have those conditions in our lives because of all the things that we're going to be facing. That's right. So um, we reviewed again the things Jesus said would be coming uh, in his sermon there uh, in Matthew 24. Uh, he shared the signs of the times and the end of the age. Uh, he shared that there would be a great tribulation. Uh, then the coming of the Son of Man. He talked about the parable of the fig tree that you could tell when it was near. Uh, and when the leaves began to come on the, on the trees, you could tell uh, that summer was near. And he said, uh, when you see these things happening, you know that my coming is near, but mm -hmm. you don't know the day nor the hour. No one knows that. And uh, then he contrasted the faithful servant and the evil servant. Uh, the faithful servant, the wise servant is going to be busy uh, giving food to those who need it in due season. In other words, we're going to continue ministering to others. Uh, and the foolish servant is going to... Uh, uh, be mistreating others instead. He says, don't be mm -hmm. like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Then he predicted the destruction of the temple, uh, the signs of the times and the end of the age. 
here in Luke, we're seeing the same kinds of things, the destruction of Jerusalem, then the coming of the Son of Man and the parable of the fig tree and the importance of watching, all of those same elements here in, mm -hmm. uh, in the Gospel of Luke as well. So they're very similar content there. So he says, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass yeah. and to stand before the Son of Man. Amen. And Pastor Ray, before we move on to Thursday, then yes. uh, when we when we're, we're talking here about the restoration includes physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual healing, we have heard uh, over the last, the course of the last, well, since the pandemic began, about how much people, and, and it's quite obvious to all of us, so many of us are affected, but the great need for mental health uh, help, the great yes. need for uh People are in just such dire need. We certainly saw that through the pandemic, but oh uh, even afterwards, the the effects of that time period was so dire for mm -hmm. so many people. The loss was so great for so many people that the the this idea of God wanting so you could see uh, the enemy of our souls attacking in that way, doing mm -hmm. just the opposite of what it is that God wants for us in terms of being spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically healthy, then he has taken advantage and has uh, created and continues to create because the aftermath of that is, is, is still pretty great. Exactly. So it's the complete antithesis of what he wants. Uh, That's right. Uh, the thief just breaks in. He wants to steal. He wants to take things away from you. That's but right. The Lord wants to add things to you. He wants to make mm -hmm. everything better in your life. And uh, we can be very thankful for that. Uh, yes. So we look Thursday at this legacy of love. And uh, Jesus put it this way. He said, by this all will know you're my disciples if you love one for another. One another. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in First John 4, this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So these passages reveal uh, things about Satan's challenge against the government of God. Because uh, he had said that God uh, was unlovingly withholding good things mm -hmm. yes. uh, from Adam and Eve. Uh, he didn't want them to to be like him. And so he was withholding these good things. Uh, but they tell us that's not true. Uh, the essence of Christianity is loving God and God loving us and loving one another. Love, love was the norm of Christian communities in the first few centuries. Tertullian uh, was an early Christian theologian. He said it's mainly the deeds of love so noble that lead many to put a brand upon us. <laughs> they say how they love one another. What a wonderful <laughs> thing to be able to say uh, mm -hmm. that Jesus' mm -hmm. uh, uh, command was being followed and that they would uh, be recognized because of this love. Uh, one of the greatest revelations of God's love was demonstrated when two devastating pandemics plagued the early centuries around AD 160 and AD 260. Mm -hmm. I imagine you found this as interesting as I did. Uh, I did, I, very interesting. You know, <laughs> having just gone through a pandemic ourselves, yes. uh, to think that these were pandemics way back then, a uh, hundred years apart, um, and how the Christians stepped forward and ministered to the sick and dying uh, during this time, I didn't know that. Uh, I, no, I, nor I. Uh, but because of their unselfish, sacrificial, caring ministry, uh, it, it made a huge impact on the population. And, and over time, thousands and eventually hundreds of thousands and then millions in the mm -hmm. Roman Empire became believers in Jesus during these two pandemics. Um, you know... <laughs> 
that's even more impressive than the 2,000 and 5,000 we read about earlier uh, at the time of the early church. Yes. You know, this yes. is more people were brought mm -hmm. to Jesus uh, by his people, by by their ministry to the sick. Uh, love, selfish, caring for people. Rodney Stark, uh, we're told in his book, The Rise of Christianity, uh, talks about this. Uh, he talks about this second epidemic, which was still... Uh, heavenly Judeo-Christian in terms of the Christian community, mm -hmm. they became a virtual army of nurses. And at the height of the second great epidemic, uh, Dionysius wrote a lengthy tribute to the heroic nursing efforts of local Christians. He said, mm -hmm. most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the six, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ, and with them departed this life serenely happy, for they were infected by others with the disease, mm -hmm. on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. Hmm. Wow. wow. Willing to die in the process of ministry. What is the obvious message for us, and how do we learn to die to self like that? Uh, well, the obvious message is that we are to love God and we're to love one another. And we're to manifest this same selfless spirit by allowing, allowing him to transform us. Uh, it's nothing we can do, as you said about uh, the, the woman trying to save herself from drowning. It's nothing we can do. Uh, it's something only he can do in us and through us. That's right. That's right. And we concluded our study on Friday uh, with the continual growth of the church. The gospel continued to spread, the number of its adherents to increase. It penetrated into regions that were inaccessible even to the eagles of Rome. You think of that, the Roman Empire <laughs> hadn't even yeah. gotten that far. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Said a Christian... You may kill us, torture us, condemn us. Your injustice is the proof that we are innocent. Mm -hmm. Does your cruelty avail you? It was but a stronger invitation to bring others to their persuasion. The oftener we're mown down by you, the more in number we grow. The blood of Christians it is seed. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We watched a uh, program last night on the incredible journey. I don't know if you are uh, familiar with that by Gary Kent, who uh, is New Zealander, I think, or Australian, maybe I'm not sure which. But anyway, he does these little 30 minute programs on. Yes, I've seen that. Yes, some, yeah, in history, and then does the correlation then with our place in history and, and, and Christ. And it's, it's absolutely, they are just so interesting. And he did the one last, did one last night, the one that we, one of the ones we watched because usually on Friday nights, we'll watch two, a couple of them um, on the Huguenots. And it was just showing how uh, you just needed to, or Mary Durand, you know, when she was, it says the woman who, the, the prisoner who was free is the was the title of that. So she was free and that God gave her freedom, but she was in prison and how it showed on the wall. So historically, he went to that where that was and you could see etched on there. Resist. I will resist because they were after her to recant, recant, recant. She was burned at the stake, as was so many of these Huguenots. And it just talked about their how, what their lives were like and how they would put gunpowder around their neck and how they would, uh, you know, walk them slowly and just, but what their demeanor was, you know, they would dress for the occasion if they had the means to do so. And that they would continue, they would try to preach like Stephen, preach that one last sermon. I was just really, because usually when we talk about the Huguenots, it's just these people out of, you don't see them, you don't, 
you don't know them. You don't, it's, it's like just reading some history. But in this instance, you got to see when they go to the museum that shows these different things, you get to actually get a better picture that, you know what, they're people kind of like us. And they made this decision and they died for it. So it, again, it was one of those things that was a very touching program to see that. And so when you when we talk about the blood of Christians as seed, for them to make the decision that yes, you can torture me, you can condemn me, you can torture me and you can kill me, but I will not recant. And the day may come for us as well. I think you're on mute, Pastor Ray. Thank you. So it was oh. true in their case as well that yes. the blood, their blood was seed and the church was a result of that as well. Yes. Um, amen. Amen. Well, mind the listeners, please, uh, uh, where they can access that kind of information. You said it was a video. It's it's on YouTube and you just search for the, you have to search in T, the incredible journey. Okay. And there's there's just lots of them. And we'll watch two or three at a time because they're only 30 minutes. And uh, the lawyer, I mean, it's just amazing uh, all the information. So he gives the historical part. If there is a museum that one can see something related to that. And then he brings in then the biblical perspective for us. And so I do. You would highly recommend. Uh, I would highly. Season. Yes. And yeah. it's Gary. Gary Kent. Yeah. Very, is the name of the person. Yeah. Very good. Uh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Let's close our study with this wonderful paragraph uh, from Great Controversy on page 47 of Great Controversy. The mysterious providence which permits the righteous to suffer persecution at the hand of the wicked has been a cause of great perplexity to many who are weak in faith. Some are even ready to cast away their confidence in God because he suffers the basest of men to prosper, while the best and purest are afflicted and tormented by their cruel power. How, it is asked, can one who is just and merciful and who is also infinite in power tolerate such injustice and oppression? Mm. This is a question with which we have nothing to do. God has given us sufficient evidence of his love, and we are not to doubt his goodness because we cannot understand the workings of his providence. That's right. As long as we remember who he is, God is love. Love. <laughs> yes. Can we in any, in any measure understand why these horrible things happen to his people no just have to hold on to that god mm -hmm. is love dear father in heaven may we truly hold on to that and may we also hold on to these things we've studied this morning these predictions of what's coming and uh what we need to be ready for and that we need to watch and wait and not put it off too far and uh, in the meantime, love one another, love you, and courageously share you with others at whatever cost it may be. In Jesus' name, we pray and thank you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Ray. And thank you, friends, for joining us. And uh, we invite you to stay by on this channel for our worship service that will begin here in just a few minutes, or join us at 48th and A Street here in Lincoln, Nebraska, for our worship services in uh, our physical location there. So friends, we pray that you will have a blessed rest of these Sabbath hours and a blessed week, and we look forward to uh, joining with you again next week to do lesson three, Light Shines in the Darkness. I'm sure it'll be another great study. So um, we uh, will say goodbye at this point and uh, 